I have been studying Mother's grimoire. Do you wish to hear what I have found? Tis not what I expected. I had hoped for a collection of her spells, a map of the power that she commands. But this is not it. Disturbed? Yes, perhaps that is the right word. One thing in particular within her writings disturbs me. Here, in great detail, Flemeth explains the means by which she has survived for centuries. Not unless one also happens to be an ancient abomination. No. Flemeth has raised many daughters over her long lifetime. There are stories of these many witches of the wilds throughout chastened legend, yet I have never seen a one, and always wondered why not. And now I know. They are all Flemeth. When her body becomes old and wizened, she raises a daughter, and when the time is right, she takes her daughter's body for her own. I do not know. Perhaps tis as she said, the Darkspawn threaten her as much as they threaten anyone else. Or perhaps she believes that this journey will make me more powerful. According to the tome, if the host is already powerful and trained in magic, it takes far less time for Flemeth to settle in. Indeed. That is primarily what this tome details. The various daughters that Flemeth has acquired. Their preparation and training. I recognize all of it. I am to be her next host. This is my purpose. There is only one possible response to this. Flemeth needs to die. I will not sit about like an empty sack waiting to be filled. Flemeth must be slain, and I need your help to do it. Then what needs to be done is for you to go back to Flemeth's hut in the Kakari Wilds without me. If I am present when she is slain, I cannot be certain that she will not be able to possess my body right then. So I must remain at the camp, confront her, and slay her quickly. I doubt she will truly be dead even then, but it will take her years to find a new host and recover her power, if that is even possible. The thing I must have is her true grimoire. With it, I can defend against her power in the future. Everything else in her hut is yours. Not really, but the sooner the better, no? I am grateful. The sooner this can be done, the sooner it will set my mind at ease. Here I am. Oh, this should be good. Go ahead. Well, the crows would have you believe that it is an involved process that takes years of training, the sort that tests both your resolve and your endurance. Survive that process and maybe, just maybe, you're good enough to start being considered one of them. But quite frankly, the truth is that all it requires is the desire to kill people for a living. It's surprising how well one can do in such a field.
within the crows I did, but it has been something the crows have devoted a great deal of time to perfecting. An assassin simply specializes in striking from stealth, and in maximizing that first attack to be as lethal as possible. Debilitate your foe, either by poison or by crippling their limbs, makes any follow-up combat you need to engage in that much simpler. See? Getting paid for the act is beside the point. An assassin is more a tactical choice than a lifestyle. Of course, the crows like to pretend that their abilities are trade secrets, shrouded in shadows and wrapped in a blanket of mystery. So let's just keep this between you and me, shall we? Hmm? Here I am. Oh, this should be good. Go ahead. Well now, I imagine that's a very fair question. Being an assassin after all is a, a living, at least as far as such things go. I was simply never given the opportunity to choose another way. So if that choice presents itself, why should I not seize upon it? Now that you mention it, I am not entirely certain. I was but a boy of seven when I was purchased. For three sovereigns, I'm told. Which is a good price, considering I was all ribs and bone and didn't know the pommel of a dagger from the pointy end. The crows buy all their assassins that way. Buy them young, raise them to know nothing else but murder. And if you do poorly in your training, you die. Of course. You compete against your fellow assassins, and those who survive are rightfully proud of it. In Antiva, being a crow gets you respect, it gets you wealth, gets you women, and men, or whatever it is you might fancy. But that does not mean doing what is expected of you always. And it means being expendable. It's a cage, if a gilded cage. Pretty, but confining. I fancy many things. I fancy things that are beautiful, and things that are strong. I fancy things that are dangerous and exciting. Would you be offended if I said I fancied you? <laughs> this is good to know. As for what I'll do in the future, presuming that there is one, I truly can't imagine. It might be interesting to go into business for myself, for a change. Far away from Antiva, of course. For now, naturally, I go where you go. And here I am, happy to be had. Isn't it wonderful how things work out that way? Come now, enough chit-chat. Talking about the crows summons them, you know. Any Antivan fishwife could tell you so. Mm hmm. All right, but I get to stare at you luridly while you do so. Oh, you wish to know about Antiva, do you? The only way to truly appreciate it would be to go there. It is a warm place, not cold and harsh like this Ferelden. In Antiva it rains often, but the flowers are always in bloom. Or so the saying goes. Every land has its assassins. Some are simply more open about their business than others. I hail from the glorious Antiva city, home to the royal palace. It is a glittering gem amidst the sand, my Antiva city. Do you come from someplace comparable? <laughs> you have me there indeed. I for one can make no such claim as I never laid eyes on the woman. Hmm. You know what is most odd? We speak of my homeland, and for all its wine, and its dark-haired beauties, and the lilo flutes of the minstrels, I miss the leather the most. <laughs> it may as well be, but not this once, no. I mean the smell. For years, I lived in a tiny apartment near Antiva City's leather-making district, in a building where the crows stored their youngest recruits, packed in like crates. I grew accustomed to the stench, even though the humans complained of it constantly. To this day, the smell of fresh leather is what reminds me most of home more than anything else.
Oh, not so long, I know. It is my first time away from Antiva, however, and the thought of never returning makes me think of it constantly. Before I left, I was tempted to spend what little coin I possessed on leather boots I spotted in the store window. Finest Antivan leather. Perfect craftsmanship. Ah, but I was a fool to leave them. I thought, ah, Zevran, you can buy them when you return as a reward for a job well done. More the fool I, no? True, and it's a comforting thought. One simply never knows what is to come next. How could I have suspected I would end up defeated by a beautiful Grey Warden? A woman who then spares my life? I could not. I say you are beautiful because it is true, should I not? And glad I am to hear it. Now, if it is all the same to you, I would prefer not to speak more of Antiva. It makes me wistful and hungry for a proper meal. Mm -hmm. Oh, this should be good. What would you like to discuss? <laughs> Right, but I get to stare at you luridly while you do so. And why not? There are many things to enjoy about being a crow in Antiva. You are respected, you are feared, the authorities go out of their way to overlook your trespasses, even the rewards are nothing to turn your nose up at. As for the killing part, well, some people simply need assassinating. Or do you disagree? Now there is an interesting word, innocent. How many men do you know who can claim to be truly innocent? But if you're talking generalities such as children and relatives and bystanders and such, never on purpose, but it happens. It's unfortunate, but death comes to us all. If not me, then some wasting disease or a fall down the stairs or at the hands of a dark spot. It's all relative in the end. Death happens, as we like to say. And when I get paid for it, death happens more often. As far as enjoying the act of killing itself, why not? There is a certain artistry to the deed. The pleasure of sinking your blade into their flesh and knowing that their life is in your hands. There are many things I did not enjoy about being a crow, of course. Having no choice, being treated as an expendable commodity, the rules, oh, so many rules. But simply being an assassin, I like it just fine. I will continue to do it if I can, even if I am not a crow. Honestly, could you picture me doing something else? <laughs> I mean professionally, or maybe you mean professionally as well. Perhaps you intend to peddle my services to bored Ferelden noblewomen. It is an interesting thought, but I've always removed my clothes strictly on an amateur basis. A talented amateur, of course, but an amateur nonetheless. Of course, all these thoughts are moot. Chances are still good that you and I will perish, eaten by darkspawn or slain by the crows at some point. Very gruesomely, I imagine. But it is pleasant enough to chat about. Come, let's move on while our boots still have some wear in them. All right, but I get to stare at you luridly while you do so. My adventures? <laughs> I'm hardly an old man just returned from across the ocean, am I? Should I shake my fist at nearby children while I talk about the good old days? Falling down a flight of stairs is an adventure. Falling into someone's bed, also an adventure. I am assuming what you're looking for are professional anecdotes. Let's see, my second mission ever for the Crows was a bit intriguing. I was sent to kill a mage who had been meddling in politics. In Antiva, nobody is too important to escape the reach of the Crows. They have killed kings and queens. That is simply how it is. As it turned out, the mage in question was quite a delightful young woman. Long, divine legs, as I recall. I caught her in a carriage on her way to escape to the provinces. 
After I killed her guard, she got down on her hands and knees and begged for her life, rather aptly, I might add. So I joined her in the carriage for the night and left the next morning. Well, yes, twice, actually. Then she decided to try and use me instead. The woman had actually convinced me to speak to the crows on her behalf. What can I say? I was young and foolish at the time. Then, as I was kissing her goodbye to return to Antiva City, she slipped on the threshold and fell backwards out of the carriage. Broke her neck. Shame, really, but at least it happened quickly. Not actually, no. I was a bit unimpressed by the development at first. Then I found out that she had told the driver to take her to Janellen instead. She had planned to lose me in the provinces. I would have looked very foolish to the crows. As it was, my master was very impressed that I had done such a fine job of making it look like an accident. The circle of magi was unaware of foul play and everyone was happier all around. I got stupid, in fact, and very lucky. It was after that when I learned that one needn't let a pretty face go to your head. Professionalism was key. That's my moral of the day, you see. Mmm, well, there is you. But I'll point out that you did have to capture me and tie me up first. Every rule has its exception. Now that I've mentioned tying me up in that context, do we have extra rope about? I've a question, if I may. Well, here's the thing. I swore an oath to serve you, yes? And I understand the quest you're on, and this is all very fine and well. My question pertains to what you intend to do with me once this business is over with, as a point of curiosity. Of course it is afterwards. The ravishing part is a given. One simply assumes that once your Grey Warden business is finished, you would have no need of an assassin to follow you about. Am I wrong? Oh, not more than friends? Indeed we shall. It is good to know what my options might be, but that is for another time. For now, we have much to do, yes? Hmm, I could teach others, but not yourself. First, I would need someone who has training as a rogue. That is, unless you would care to spend the years it takes to gain the fundamentals. But, if there should be such a person who desires this training, yes, by all means, send them to me. The crows are already furious, no? I shall enjoy tweaking their nose further. Hmm. Again? I'm game. This could be a sensitive topic, my dear lady. Are you sure you wish to voyage there? As you wish. Let me start by saying that my history is varied, indeed. It has also not been restricted to women. Does that offend you? I grew up amongst whores, my dear. Sex is best when done well, and truly, that is my only rule. Do I prefer women? Yes, yes, I believe I do. But you must understand that a certain open-mindedness is sought by the crows in their recruits, for very good reasons. I have had to do many things in my work as an assassin, some pleasant and many not so. The crows recruit elven assassins because we are considered beautiful by humans. I'm sure you can imagine the rest. I cannot change my past, obviously. I regret far more than the men and women I have been with, and if that is more than you can bear, well, then it is good we know now, yes? Ah, it's just old scars and nothing more which you see. Ignore them as I do, and perhaps they'll go away. Ah, enough talk of the past. It is what lies ahead that is important, no? Mm hmm. All right, but I get to stare at you luridly while you do so. Again? Well, now, what might interest you, I wonder? 
Shall I describe the stages involved with Lanthrax poisoning? I watched a man go through all seven once. Aha, you have rather macabre tastes, I see. I like that. Let's see, how about the largest battle I ever took part in? That would have been the slaughter of Prince Azrin. Did you hear of that down in these parts? Me? Not personally, but I did take part in the attack. Prince Azrin was fourth in line to the throne, you see. He started off as 11th, but worked his way up the old-fashioned method by inheriting control of an entire Crocell from his grandfather. After assassinating his way through the royal family, the king hired three other cells to take down Prince Azrin once and for all. I was in one of those cells. And even royalty is very much bound up in the crows. You wouldn't want it run by a bunch of commoners, after all, would you? And this means they get involved in politics quite often. This particular fight nearly bankrupted the nation, I understand. It almost ended up putting a crow on the throne, a commoner. But that's a whole different story. I played a very small part. My part in the entire battle was taken up trying to reach Princess Ferina, who had thrown in with her brother. I killed about 11 of her guards personally before I got knocked out of a window. I landed in a river and nearly drowned. I was fished out by some urchins who robbed me blind. Made off with my boots, too. At least they didn't cut my throat. And that was my part in history. <laughs> it's true. I live a charmed life. One of the prostitutes that raised me was a fortune teller. Said I wouldn't die young. She was rather startled by that. But there you go. Tale told. Let's be off before I tell more embarrassing stories, huh? Mm hmm. All right. But I get to stare at you luridly while you do so. Well, the only one that's really worth telling is the story of the mission right before I came to Ferelden. But no, I... I would rather not. I, I shouldn't have said anything. Thank you. Perhaps another day, huh? Mm hmm. Again? I'm game. Yeah. <laughs>